Artery recordings. Hey guys, Shan Dan here from Artery Recordings on the line with Zach Yosh. Um, today we're going to talk about, um, you know, utilizing promoters as kind of the, the gatekeepers uh, to the next level uh, of the music industry. You know, it's a great way to kind of get new opportunities, stuff like that. You know, Zach Yosh has worked from, with everybody from Asking Alexandria to Tech Nine to Black Veil Brides. Um, he's an A&R at KBB Records, Talent Buyer Extraordinaire in Arizona, you know, uh, K&Z Management, a, a bunch of, of stuff. Zach's a very talented guy, so I figured it was, you know, perfect, uh, you know, it would be a perfect opportunity for us to kind of get answers on that. Um, but uh, Zach, tell us a little bit about, um, you know, working with local talent. Um, I mean, our company was pretty much founded on uh, mainly like local bands. Like when we started, yeah. I mean, I had these bands that I was managing, and I felt like the only way to get them treated fairly was to throw the concert ourselves rather than have some other promoter locally, you know, either exploit them or take advantage of them. So, you know, my partner Kyle and I, I you know, we come from touring backgrounds. We started KMZ Entertainment in 2008, and uh, basically, you know, we just, um, you know, we just started throwing shows for local bands, and we tried to make the local bands look. Uh, kind of bigger than um, what they were. You know, we, we needed to make them look like they were national bands. So we created themes. We created you know cool photo shoots of these bands to you know give the presentation that they were larger than life. And you know we kind of built a local scene based on that. And then suddenly it caught on with some agents. And uh, uh, next thing you know, almost ninety percent of what we're doing is a national show. So that's awesome, man. Um, so you know, not a lot of people realize you know that there is a middle ground to getting signed you know it's often sure. you know where i get hit up it's like you know how how can we uh become famous overnight you know like mm -hmm. uh sign us and I'll, I'll say oh how how many shows you play like uh have you have you been on tours have you done any of this stuff and most of them haven't because they want to kind of skip that middle ground and sure. you're actually the person that makes that middle ground you know where it's like this this huge opportunity to start playing you know bigger shows and get more notoriety and stuff like that uh from from their aspect um now what's the best way for a band to step into that role like how do they get your attention um i i feel like a band you know t in order to like if the goal for a band is to be serious and get signed and become a national touring act you know um i it's sounds cliche to say this but even at the local level i really truly believe that uh it absolutely starts and ends with music you either have songs that people are going to want to pay money to go see and connect with and watch a good live show um and be entertained or they're just not going to care you know and you could be you know like i have a lot of bands that will hit me up that i try to avoid actually they're like i can sell 50 to 100 tickets to open for asking alexander because all my friends love asking alexander but the key in adding a local to a national show is to add local support so i want them to bring their own fan base in conjunction with the fan base that already exists for these national bands to help build the show um i feel like the bands that i've seen over the years get signed after kind of using knz as a launching pad to like grow their fan base in the local scene were the ones that had like a really good professional recorded record or bands that you know they spread it out they didn't play the same market over and over and over again um they would you know they'd play every weekend but they'd play you know out of state or you know 90 miles away this way or that way or they'd play a house show whatever you know they would spread it out in a way that was logical and you know they would build their fan base based on that but at the end of the day i've always believed that if you don't have a like you have to have the it factor you have to have a great live show a great image and you have to have songs that are going to make people care and if you don't have those things um the labor of love will only go so long before it like starts to diminish and you know i've noticed like you know uh, i've managed this band called city in the sea they're kind of on hiatus right now but, but you know we played maybe seven months of shows and then you know we did a showcase for sumerian records and ended up getting a deal and it wasn't because we were the biggest band locally it wasn't because like you know um they had done all these crazy tours or anything independently or had this viral following it was because they had songs that were absolutely catching on no matter what setting I put them in, you know? Yeah. And I think Ash saw the same thing in that and ended up giving them a deal and they went on to do mayhem and great things. But that was kind of the cool cornerstone that made me realize like when myspace died i felt like the, the statistical thing based on like, Oh, this band has this amount, amount of plays. This band has, you know, this amazing MySpace tricked out page and whatnot. When when Facebook became the main platform, it was like everyone was brought down to the same level, 
and you had to be good again at music in order to like be yeah. taken serious. So, and uh, songwriting is to me was the main element which got them catapulted to Sumerian Records, City in the Sea. That is. That's cool, man. Um, so, uh, you know, it it is like often, oftentimes people do forget that you know the package you are selling is music. It's got to be good sure. music on the base and um you know i i i often add you know to that list of, of stuff a band needs to be successful is solid marketing as well sure. because 100 the best album if it doesn't get heard you know isn't gonna get the attention unless you have a solid marketing uh right. aspect as well but um one thing i wanted to talk to you about as well and i've seen this happen a lot is you know bands don't they don't tend to understand the concept of pre-sales like they they sure. complain you know uh, I don't want to sell tickets, you know, to a, yeah. to a show and stuff like that. And I always explain, you know, it's it's pricey to do these shows. And for the opportunity, like, you know, if you're going to sell 50 pre-sales, those pre-sales go to pay guarantees, venue, you know, all types of stuff. Um, but uh, another thing of, of the matter is, like, when you get that opportunity, you can make money off merch, but a lot of bands don't bring merch to those kind of shows when they sell 50 pre-sales. So right. I guess the question is, um, why do they have to sell pre-sales and what's the benefit of the opportunity? Well, I, I've always seen a pre-sale ticket as a tool to get someone to actually commit. It, mm. it turns um, a fan into a hard ticket buyer, you know? Okay. Uh, um, 90% of the shows that I have where I have a local opening, it's usually because if we don't have local support, we're probably not going to be able to cover all the expenses. But the reason I have to do a show like that where I, I, as a promoter, don't really make any money is because I have to you know, keep the relationship with the agent to book the big bands like Asking, Blackville, whatever got to book all the small bands and pay these higher guarantees in order to get you know the big things which are going to be like home runs which could possibly fund your company for the next x amount of months so um when a band sells tickets you know it's one of those things like i always pay a band uh, whether the show loses or not i pay them two bucks a ticket so they get something away from it and then you know they can sell their merchandise and then on top of that they can make a ton of fans you know gaining from you know the larger audience that they wouldn't be usually opening for on a regular local show so um I really think that, like, again, back to what I said, it starts with music. It's easier for some bands that I've seen locally to sell tickets because people are just attracted to that band. Um, they like the band. I mean, it takes a lot for a person, a patron, to to go to a show, like, when, you know, they have school, they have work, they have a girlfriend, they have a family, whatever. It takes a lot for them to commit uh, to going out to a show and, you know, spending some time to watch some bands. So if they're going to buy a pre-sale ticket from a local band, you know, this local band better dazzle their minds in some form or another otherwise they're not going to repeat the same business like i have some bands that you know can sell 50 tickets the day before show in one batch text message and then i have other bands that you know if they don't have a month plus they have to like you know really hustle and like you know go out and try to like get people to commit because either a they don't have a record or b they just don't have like the right like i said it factor the right playing ability image etc like it's a package deal and we have to remember like uh, as uh, as bands as artists, they have to remember that like you are there to entertain other people. They are not there to entertain you. You know. So if you're the star, if you're the entertainer, if you're the songwriter, you need to give people a reason to actually want to like spend ten, fifteen bucks to come see your band, whether you're opening for a bigger band or not. That's awesome. Yeah, makes makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, a lot of times uh, I, I tend to see bands forget that it is business as well. You know, sure. Where um, you know, the show isn't there to give them some kind of uh, ego boost and make them feel like rock stars. You know, it's it's there to uh, cultivate right. fans and make it a viable uh, brand. You know, and uh, yeah, sometimes absolutely. it's hard to to figure out. You know. Yeah, the, the key with all artists, signed or not, um, local or national, is to turn them into the hard ticket bands. You know, like um, there's some bands that, you know, I've booked where I have to stack some locals to get bodies out because they're just not hard ticket bands, but they're amazing live and they have that novelty to get locals to want to open and build a big show around it. Um, but there's some bands, like, for example, um, like Limp Biscuits, the perfect. Uh, uh, soft ticket band like they're amazing on festivals you put them as a headliner a festival yeah there, no one in the festival is going to leave because it's Limp Biscuit. but if you were to put Limp Biscuit in a headlining situation that's not in a festival you know you'll do a thousand twelve hundred people but it's not something that people are just going to be automatic hard ticket band anymore you know yeah, yeah. and now uh just for for our viewers what's the difference between uh soft ticketing and hard ticketing 
Um, like Soft Ticket is like you know a type of band um, where you can add it to a festival and it's just a huge hit. Everyone will just it'll just explode. It'll be amazing. The show will just go off. Um, but then a, a hard ticket band is you know like a day to remember for example you could put them as a headliner and people are going to come because a day to remember is playing they will absolutely pay whatever ticket price it takes to see them mm -hmm. so there's two, there's two types of levels of band that I've noticed as a promoter over the years and I love all all the bands that come through I think they're all necessary to create the science of a great show but some bands just don't produce hard tickets but they do produce an entertaining show which makes the package great and some bands which are hard ticket bands you know they put the bodies in the room which make it all you know one big cohesive success however you have to have soft ticket bands in order to sell the package big as it is like um i know that a, a group like slipknot it's not as intriguing to just go see Slipknot with one opener. It's more intriguing, oh, I get to go see Slipknot with Lamb of God, Bullet for My Valentine, mm -hmm. Motionless and White. Oh, yeah, the arena's packed, you know? Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's all about the science. Like, they're really, it sounds silly, but there really is a science to putting a great show on. And I think a lot of it has to do with getting the, the right look of the package, the right team, but also having soft ticket bands that um, will make the show great, but then also enough hard ticket bands to get the bodies in the room, you know? Okay. Absolutely. Makes sense. Um, okay, I guess the last question I have for you on this is uh, what tips can you give bands, like local bands, to you know, accelerate their career and get on the right path to uh, you know, more international success? Um, I've noticed over the years that there is just, it's, there's so many bands now and there's so much competition. You have got to be willing to do whatever it takes to... Um, to, to make your band successful. It's almost like you have to be fixated on 100% uh, all the time, all day, the band, the band, the band, the band. What can what am I constantly be doing in my free time to elevate the band? You know, if I'm not working my job to help, you know, fund the practice space and buy new gear and whatnot, I need to basically like, you know, what can I be doing in my free time to help elevate the band? Because there's so many bands that I've met who, who are so 100% fixated on the band mm -hmm. that um, if you aren't fixated like that, there's probably someone else behind you that will, who's younger, better looking, better player, better songwriter, that will surpass you pretty quick. So it really comes down to like how dedicated. It's like you got to treat it as a job, but it also has to be your passion. Like we're in a time in music where music just doesn't sell anymore, and the probability of hitting a split point to where a band can actually make a living off of it, it's just it's slim. But it's not impossible, you know. Mm -hmm. You have to, and a lot of bands, you know, they come out of left field. They don't want to build the business. Like the average business takes four to five years to like break even or lose money to actually get it to be profitable. And bands have to see their band as in the same limelight as, yeah, it's going to take a while to build there. But if we keep moving forward, if we keep fixated on the goal, we keep setting small goals to reach the big goal, we can get there. You know, it's it's one of those things. It's like I can sit here and talk about marketing. I can sit here and talk about what you can do social media wise or whatever. The reality is is if you're passionate about it and you believe in your band unconsciously, you will find the way and you will follow a path that will get you there. You know, I mean yeah. I can sit here, I can literally talk about like all these marketing techniques you can use and whatnot. But at the end of the day, if you have the right songs it will just take on a life of its own, whether it's on the internet or whether it's live locally. It will take on a life of its own, um, and you can follow that. And I've always encouraged local bands more than anything, focus on your songwriting and focus on writing songs that will make the hair on your arm stand up because if you don't have the right songs, it's not going to like catch on in the way that you want. It's like one thing, you know, you can go to In-N-Out Burger, you can tell, like, man, this burger tastes a hell of a lot better than McDonald's, but McDonald's is pumping marketing, pumping all this stuff into it to make it bigger. Yeah. However, at the end of the day, if I have the choice, I'm going to In-N-Out Burger because it's just better. Yeah, you yeah. Know? So I really feel like your product is everything, and if you can make a record that can affect people, um, it will just take on a life of its own. And that's you know what you do in the studio and what you do in the writing process is going to affect the next year, two years of that record cycle, whether you be local or national. You know, yeah. and I highly encourage local bands. Like, you know, you got to get back to the reason why people started playing music in the first place, and that was to convey an emotion, convey a message, and you have to make sure that your band is writing songs that are going to affect people. Otherwise, you know, I can sit here and you you can sit here with me. We can talk about what do we got to do, what do we got to do. Yeah. At the end of the day, you got the songs you don't. You know, yeah. I've seen plenty there's no, of bands. There's no form, perfect formula to sure. escaping and stuff like that. It does come yeah. down to hard work. And, uh, you know, I feel like it, it'd be good to, to mention as well that, you know, 
especially dealing with local bands, stuff like that, you see yeah. something good, but then they give up pretty quick. Yeah. You know, because they don't see <laughs> instantaneous success. So, I yeah, mean, that's good- another thing I've noticed. We, we live in a time where it's like uh, no one wants to work hard for anything anymore. Mm-hmm. And if they are going to work hard, they want instantaneous gratification. Yeah. And the reality is there's that 1% of bands that will blow up virally overnight and just be handed everything. And everyone else has to work for it. I remember I did this Ask Alexandria show where Amir was direct support right when Speaker of the Dead came out and they, I remember Frankie and them telling me like, oh my god, this is like the first tour we've been on where we haven't been com- treated like complete shit. <laughs> I'm like, well, I mean, you, write the, you wrote the right record, it's selling well, you're drawing people now, you're a force to be re- reckoned with, this is like your, I don't want to call it your breakout record, but this is definitely a moment in your career that you're going to shine and mm-hmm. they started to realize like, oh my god, you know, let's just write the best records we can write and we'll start to be you know, things will just fall into place, you know? Yeah. That's cool. So, I mean, the best strategy for unsigned or, or, you know, local bands, too, is to maybe come up with a five-year plan or something sure. where, you know, for the first few they tour, you know, heavily get on bigger bigger tours through, uh, you know, promoters, sell pre-sales, yeah. you know, eventually put out an even better album, you know, after having yeah. notoriety, get signed, hopefully. Yeah, some yeah. local bands, it might take them two or three records to get it right and to find mm-hmm. what works for them in order to you know get that following built up locally i mean some bands hit it on the first record great some bands you know i always encourage bands it's like you know you got to look at it like and you got to like listen to other people's advice and like um i feel like people who listen have the most power and i tell a lot of bands like you know like you just said there's no set formula for a local band to become a national band and become this touring sign thing if that's and a lot of bands will come to my office they'll be like um you know, what is, uh, I'll be like, what's your favorite band? And they'll be like, this band. And I'll be like, okay, you should broaden your horizons. You should listen to everything out there. Like if, if you say that this band is your favorite band, it's almost like putting a ceiling over your head and saying, I can never be bigger than this band. Uh, I'm going to be the poor man's version of this band. It's like, break out of that. Be open to more and, and just ask questions and listen and, you know, find a way to like, you know, pave your own path. I, I feel like I had this conversation um, with Rob Zombie's manager recently, and uh, we were talking about how in the last 10 years, I haven't seen a single artist other than maybe Lady Gaga that's just been like, pardon my French, fuck you. You know, everyone's been falling into this formula or what other bands are doing. No one's worrying about what they're doing. They're worrying about what the... Uh, the the culture of music is doing, you know? And really, you know, the biggest bands in the world, like Nine Inch Nails, Madonna, um... You know, even ICP, as silly as that sounds, um, these bands have created complete countercultures, you yeah. know, within music. And I really feel like, you know, if you want your band to be big locally, if you want your band to be successful, you need to build a culture around it, um, not fall into um, the formula and what I call maybe the machine, you know. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with, like, you know, doing what other bands do to be successful, but the more time a local band spends seeing what other people are doing rather than worrying about what they're doing, it just takes away from them focusing on their band and working hard for what their goals are. I mean, if their sh- their goal is to sign and get tour and, and tour, you know, okay, what do bands that sign and tour do? Okay, well, we gotta have a great record, we gotta have a great image, we gotta have a great live show, and start building based on that. But first and foremost, like I always said, music uh, before anything, mm-hmm. the, the hair better stand up on your arm when you hear it, or go back to the drawing board because there will be another band behind you that will write that song. You know? Yeah. Perfect note to end on. Well, uh, you know, thanks for watching, everybody. Um, we, we talked about a bunch of cool stuff with Zach Yosh from K&Z. Um, uh, if you want to see more stuff like this, please subscribe up here. There should be a button. And um, if you have any questions, please leave them in the comments. But uh, thanks for talking with me, Zach. Sure, it was fun. Thanks, dude. Awesome. Thanks, man. Archery Recordings.